Yes, the song needs to be longer. I know. <laughs> I uh, I forgot all about that. I so I had to keep on pushing the button on my my Rode Caster Pro, which has a canned bit of music there that I used to use for my show. Just kept on pushing that button. I love that tune. Hopefully you loved it too. Uh, I will. I promise to have a piece of music in there that is really enjoyable to listen to. I mean, that that whole two uh, uh, two minutes and 30 seconds prior to there, that's so that I can get my crap together. I pretty much had it together. <laughs> Other than pushing that button over and over again. But thank you very much for showing up. This is Zero Days to Expiration. Uh, this is the final hour, what I used to call the final hour show. I haven't really come up with a a name for this show yet but let me let me tell you a little bit about what this is <clears throat> this is the companion show to the zero-dte.com coaching and mentoring service where we teach people how to become professional traders trading a strategy that's all based around zero dte that's zero days to expiration we trade the S spx or the sp s p index as well as the e-mini futures and other derivatives of uh, similar ilk on the very last day of options expiration, and we build up uh, a wide range of um, edges that we have in that, and we teach people how to become professional traders. All right, and uh, every day uh, we're in our Discord trade room, and uh, during that day I have a live session with everybody, and we talk about the trades. This show now has taken on a new flavor. It's going to be... Um, set up into two segments every day. So the first half hour, which we're in right now, we'll talk about the the market, the day, the trades that we put on, the reason for getting into those trades, and uh, also look at if we're still in those trades, uh, perhaps even uh, take those trades into expiration and derive a profit from it. But you'll learn a lot from that perspective. And then the second half of the show, uh, the second half hour, I'll have a more densely compact topic oriented show about something about about the strategy, the process, the methods that we use, or something more general. Uh, the next several shows, I'm actually doing a live online course. And so yesterday I introduced the course. Today will be the first module of that course. That course will then be, repackaged and put on our, on a uh, on our website zero-dte.com where you are more than welcome it will be available to you so that you can watch that course at your leisure and learn how we do our most basic trade which we call the classic out of the money butterfly for that zero dte and um, and that uses a a uh, highly asymmetric uh, risk to reward strategy. I think that you're going to find that extremely enlightening. And that's kind of the basis for most of our strategies. So let's get on to what today is about. Uh, the other part of the show is that we will also, uh, you know, just before we get to that second half, we'll do a roll call. Uh, we'll um, ask for, we'll look at, uh, do any kind of Q&A. Uh, etc. And I noticed that uh, some people are saying, hey, your song needs to be longer. <laughs> or I guess the intro could be shorter. That's uh, that's true. No, I'm going to go for the longer song. So there we go. And uh, so save up your questions. Uh, and uh, near the end of this segment, we'll do a little Q&A. We might even have a little contest at the end of the day. Uh, all kinds of different things planned. So there you go. Also, the, uh, I think I have mentioned this, that um, this show, along with the content-heavy segment, will be repackaged into a podcast. Well, it's my podcast, or the podcast. There's now something like 104 episodes. And uh, that we'll repackage that and put it up onto the podcast as well, and as well as uh, create a couple of blog posts from this. So that's what this is all about. And, of course, the first two shows... You know, we're getting our stride together, getting better at it. By next week, it'll seem like we've been doing it for a year, I hope. That's the, uh, that's the real hope here. So today was Fed Day, and uh, an interesting day it was. 
So what is Fed Day? Fed Day, well, most traders know what that is, and that's when the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, they get together and they talk about how they're going to slice and dice up the world and how the banks are going to operate, what their interest rates are, what their plan are for um, plan is for either hiking uh, or adjusting monetary policy, and then they come out with their minutes on a day like today. They release it at two p.m., and that will give us an overview of what the Fed is looking to do into the future. Now, it's very important for traders to understand what the Fed is going to do, because the Fed, and with their monetary policy, are essentially dictating what the cost of money is going to be uh, going into the future. And the biggest thing on the minds of traders right now, as you know, is interest rate hikes. And we are in a highly inflationary environment, and the Federal Reserve wants to squash that the best they can, or they think that they're controlling the problem that they actually are, or partially responsible for creating. And they do that through interest rate, interest rate hikes with the intent of slowing down the, quote, heated economy. But everyone knows the economy is not heated. It's not why we have inflation. We have inflation because of a myriad of other reasons. It certainly isn't because uh, we're just going off the hook, right? Although that seems to be a disconnect between the Fed, the government, and then everybody else. It's like they're living in a different world. Anyways, that's leading us down to uh, the potential for a different type of inflation. See, typically you go into an inflationary environment because an economy is hot. And then you need to, you know, slow it down. And sometimes they overshoot and slow that down. And by slowing it down, that will then slow down the economy, etc. But in this case, the economy is already slow. We already have manufacturing that's contracting and all the different services are contracting and uh, people are starting to uh, get laid off. The biggest tech companies have frozen, um, essentially frozen hiring, and a lot of them are letting people uh, go. And, of course, um, employment is sort of like a lagging indicator that happens after the fact. And so all of that is happening. So what we're really going into is a weakened economy with inflation. And what they call that, that's the worst of both worlds. That's called stagflation. And that's where you have a weak economy with rising inflation. Now, uh, there, the reason why today was kind of a downer is that the Fed made it very clear that they're going to keep the pedal to the metal and keep raising interest rates. Now, just last meeting, they rose interest rates by 50 basis points or half a point. And I believe that brings us up to 4.5% total. Now, we're still in a, uh, a you know, a, um, a negative interest rate scenario because inflation is actually around 7, 7.5%. We're at 4.5%. There's a negative 3%. If um, th that would still be what some people would call an accommodative monetary policy. That's not tightening. Tightening would be interest rates that are higher than inflation. However, the Fed is still on this idea that somehow they're going to I don't know, meander and mold the economy and move it in for this kind of soft landing. And so we won't feel any of the pain, but we know that that's not true. So there is going to be pain. There's going to be a lot of pain. And a lot of people are predicting that this recession is going to be the doozy of all recessions. You think that 2008 was big. This is going to be bigger. And that's because we are paying for decades of malfeasance by central banks. So the economy, uh, the market, the institutions, the traders, they're out there and their one goal, their one hope is that the Fed will ease off because they are totally hooked on the accommodative monetary policy that led us into this mess where interest rates were low and money was free and everything was cool. And it's not like that anymore. And what they want is they want to see those times again. It's what they call a pivot. In other words, the Fed will decide that at some point, the harm that they're inflicting on our economy is so bad that they have to pivot. But they can't. You see, because 
they are still actually contributing to an accommodative policy which actually increases inflation. So the very thing that they're trying to fight by raising interest rates or by not raising them enough with inflation higher is still contributing to inflation, right? So we have basically ne a negative 3% interest rates or higher. A lot of people think it's a lot higher because of the, the newfangled way that the Fed decides how they're going to calculate uh, inflation in the same way that they have this newfangled way of calculating GDP. It's all more of a political game made to look a lot better than it is. And, and by, I think, most people uh, people's account, when they look at real inflation, the things that uh, they pay for on a daily basis, food, energy, clothing, those prices are up more than 7.5%, 8%. They're up 15, 20, 25% or more. So, and also uh, housing. Housing is way up. Mortgage rates have now uh, gone up. They're up uh, around 6.5%, 7% now, where they were down around 1%, 2 3% for the longest time. The housing market uh, is one of the first bubbles that's going to contract. Uh, auto sales have started to collapse, especially um, uh, used cars. It, it was at one point that used cars were in such high demand because new cars were a hard thing to come by because of supply chain issues and other problems with technology not being delivered in time for them. That old or used cars became a huge hot commodity and their prices skyrocketed. Now, CarMax, they can't give a car away. Their sales or their uh, purchase of, of um, inventory has gone down 40 to 50%. They are selling at a rate of about 40% of what they were selling just a little while ago. So used car sales have uh, collapsed. New car sales are starting to come down. The, uh, the one manufacturer that's probably going to look really good at this because they have orders out the yin-yang for as far as the eye can see, and they can't make enough cars, is Tesla, although they've been under intense pressure late, lately because of more of a political kind of um, brand uh, deterioration point of view as opposed to what is related to the actual fundamentals of the company. Their stock has just been hammered. Of course, Tesla is largely considered a technology company uh, like Apple or Facebook or any of these other companies. They are technology companies and they as a group have been uh, hammered which is normal, uh, but uh, Tesla, I guess, can be grouped in that because they are largely a technology company, more, more so than just an automotive company, but they're falling into that same, they're, falling, they're getting it from both sides. They're getting it from the automotive side and the technology side, and then the third side, their brand deterioration because of some of the antics of their, their leader, Elon Musk, and uh, some people are quite upset with the way he's handled himself, his distraction from Tesla and being involved in Twitter. Of course, you know, he's got Solar City, he's got uh, uh, he's got SpaceX, uh, what else has he got? He's got all of these companies going that are just incredible uh, companies. And I, I think that people are losing sight of the actual fundamentals of those companies and how strong a position they are compared to all the others of similar class. One of the big things that most people are missing about Tesla is that not only are they big in terms of EV technology or electric vehicle technology, but also artificial intelligence. And of course, Elon Musk uh, was one of the founders of uh, a newfangled AI Phenom Chat GPT, which has come out recently. It's been out for a little over a month now. And uh, that is really opening people's eyes up about the future and what it's going to look like with AI. And what a lot of people don't understand is that AI is built into every Tesla automobile. In fact, one might say that uh, they have a lead on all things AI, probably way bigger than Google or Microsoft or, and also, you know, chat, open AI who has chat GPT is really a derivative or com came out of that whole, that whole sphere. So, so, um, 
Tesla is really an AI company too, as well as a robotics company. Uh, they in fact have uh, something like on the order of almost 300,000 cars out there that are being tested uh, for their full um, automated driving. Those are essentially robots with AI in them. So <clears throat> that's a uh, that's big deal. And I think that's being overlooked by the market. That'll be rectified, I'm sure, soon enough. Tesla has taken a huge hit. Huge mammoth. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know that that can stay down there that long. It's just the fundamental story is just too strong. They are building new factories. They, they have orders, like I said, that they're going out the yin-yang. Their Cybertruck is now going to uh, be uh, manufactured soon. That is going to take the whole world by storm. So, yeah, I mean, if there was ever a, uh, a case for a growth company, um, Tesla is it. Tesla is the new Apple. Well, they're actually, I think they're way beyond Apple. All right. So that's the state of the economy now. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different facets to it. I think that um, this coming year is going to be a tough year. There are notable people like uh, Michael Burry that are saying that um, we still have another 50% to go down before we find any kind of bottom. I think it's also a, uh, a consensus that that bottom is not going to be like our uh, that V bottom that we saw in 2008 or a U bottom like we saw uh, during the dot-com era. It's going to be something more akin to an L bottom, which really isn't a bottom. Well, I guess it's a bottom, but it doesn't really show any significant recovery. So in other words, I'm expecting that prices are going to drop again and uh, we're going to go into that recession and then we're going to level out. So it's going to be coming down and then the then the L, right? I'm down and then the L. I'm trying to do it in Europe and then just sort of stay there and then wander until maybe 2024 when when things start to pick up again. And uh, that's going to be tough. This is going to be a very difficult time. Not so much for zero DTE traders, because all of that doesn't really affect us that much, to tell you the truth. If anything, it creates an environment that makes it a little bit easier for us to do our jobs. All right. <laughs> so um, let's see. If you're, uh, if you're out in the chat room, why don't you put a comment down there, tell me what you think, and then we'll get to you, we'll get to a roll call pretty soon, so. And uh, if you enjoy the content so far, give this video a thumbs up, and if you're not a subscriber already, please subscribe. So today, as I said, we had the Fed minutes. The market went down very quickly, but before the Fed came out, the Fed minutes came out around two o'clock, Earlier in the day, we had some economic reports that were pretty impactful. We had the ISM manufacturing, which showed extreme contraction in the market. And uh, then we had the uh, JOLTS uh, new job openings report, which actually showed something contrary to extreme contraction to, uh, to manufacturing, and that is a whole bunch of new jobs that have been created. I'm not sure exactly how you comport those two things, but I think that I think that confused the market uh, for a bit. Um, at first, the market was kind of like all over the place trying to figure out where to go. And there was quite a bit of volatility and then it just started to, to rise. So first it dropped and then it, then it rose. And so that looked like that's where the market was going. And that's actually what most people expected if you were to sort of strip away the presence of one of these major economic reports, let's say that they didn't come out at all. I think most people were expecting a rise into the Fed meeting with the anticipation that the Fed may be considering a pivot. This is really what's on the, uh, I guess, the hidden agenda of Wall Street. They are trying to project to the Fed, you must pivot. You must pivot. We're giving you our vote to pivot. And as soon as they get any indication that there's going to be a pivot, this market is going to the moon, at least temporarily. Now, that didn't come. The minutes came out, and it was a completely different story. And so the market dropped. Now, it only dropped so far, because I think that they're still 
the market, Wall Street, investors are still looking at these reports that have been coming out and the dire situation and putting this all together and saying, look, the Fed can only go so far because they have that dual mandate, right? And that's to have a stable money supply and uh, employment. Now, right now, the Fed has taken the stance that inflation is more important than any of that. But there's going to come a time where they're going to say, yeah, screw that. We have to get back to the political game and do um, do what uh, their mandate is, and that's to try to stimulate or engender maximum employment and keep a stable money supply. That's the one part, I think, where they're going to have their hands full. I don't know exactly how they're going to do that. And uh, it just uh, makes me think that some of the worst is yet to come. All right. <laughs> So hopefully all of this makes sense, and hopefully I, I describe this correctly. Uh, you understand um, that we're in a big pile of doo-doo. Not pew-pew, doo-doo. There may be some pew-pewing out there, if you know what I mean. All right. Um, so this morning, because of this, the state of things, uh, I recommended that that I thought the market would be going up, and that's where it started to go up, only because of the sentiment of the market wanting or projecting that they want the Fed to pivot. So that's what they were doing. So I advised uh, our membership to take only long positions or directional asymmetric trades, uh, but at the same time, keep it close to the vest. In other words, uh, trade small. And so the way I chose to do that is by uh, not going for the full-size contracts, but going for the micro contracts. And that ended up being a good decision uh, because once the Fed minutes did come out, that just that ruined the party. And so that's where we're at now. So I, we can uh, go to the mark to the charts, and I can show you all of that right here. So hopefully, I already painted this picture for you, but um, right here is where the market opened. And you can see that we had all of this back and forth, back and forth, because we had those two conflicting market reports that came out, the ISM manufacturing, which showed severe contraction, and then the JOLTS new job openings report, which showed something that was totally contrary to that, an abundance or an, a, um, you know, a number that was very hot, that there were lots of new job openings coming out and, and one has to wonder, how do those two things fit? So that's why the market's going back and forth like this until finally they decided that, uh, I don't know about that. So, <laughs> so it went down, went down hard until the, uh, the market sort of, you know, gathered itself, dusted the, uh, the, you know, got the dust off, brushed themselves off and started uh, going on the track that they wanted to be on in the first place and anticipating or showing or demonstrating to the Fed, this is what they want, All right? So here we are rising into that expectation. Uh, and this would uh, represent our strategy up here. Uh, never quite made it that high. Uh, our strategy was actually way out of the money, like way up here somewhere. And uh, never really made it up there. And then finally, the, uh, the Fed minutes came out uh, right... Uh, right there, All right? Fed minutes came out, dropped hard, market rethought itself, tried to do a, you know, a little bit of a rebound and then dropped hard again. And then finally said, hmm, we're not showing the Fed what we really need to show them that we want higher markets. We need higher markets. And so there, now this wasn't a, um, this wasn't an interest rate hike event. Uh, that doesn't come until February. So there's even some, some people that are suggesting that uh, the Fed may not even raise interest rates or do nothing in February when that time comes for them to make that decision, just to let their interest rate hikes that they've done so far kind of settle in. Uh, but that could change depending on the type of economic reports we see between now and then. So we're going to be in no man's land between now and mid-February. 
I'm not sure exactly when that report comes out. Let's just check that. We can check that by going to the um, the Fed Rate Watch tool, and uh, we can do that. Let's see. Do I have that um, set up here? Let's re reload this page. All right. So here's the uh, the Fed target rate, or what they call the Fed watch tool. And uh, this is where the, uh, the bond market is essentially laying down odds for what the next rate hike is going to be. And we can see that, oh, that's going to be on February 1st. So it's really not too far away in another three and a half weeks, four weeks, about three and a half weeks. Well, I guess it would be four weeks, right? 31 days in January, it's the, the fourth. So almost exactly four weeks, just under four weeks. There is a 72% chance that the Fed, now we're currently between uh, four and a quarter and four and a half. And they're only looking at four and a half to 475 as their best bet. In other words, they expect the Fed to raise rates by 25 basis points only. And uh, there's a 72% chance of that and a 28% chance that they're going to raise it by 50 basis points or half a percent. And this is, you know, in the face of what the what Jerome Powell and uh, the FOMC just reported that they're going to keep the pedal to the metal. Now, their last one was 50 basis points, and before that, I think they had, I don't know, five or six or seven, 75 basis point hikes. That doesn't really comport to the tenor, uh, the tone of that report, that FOMC report that came out today. So let's see how that changes, and over the next four weeks, looking at economic reports that may, because the Fed largely considers themselves data-driven, uh, I think that those economic reports are going to be impactful. So there we are with that. There's the Fed Watch tool. Really, really important to keep an eye on that. Usually pretty, you know, spot on. Bond market, uh, the, some of the smartest people in the world there. Don't always have it right, but they've been pretty spot on in terms of their predictive powers when it comes to rate hikes. All right. All right, let's see. Let's get back to... We're, we're under a little bit of pressure here. The market just hasn't been able to catch a bid. Did for a little bit, but it's been knocked down with the negative words of the Fed. Uh, let's see what else is happening in the world today. Gold is on a tear. Gold is set to break out big time. Look at that. Look at that. We have this rising wedge and it just, it's blasting off. Silver, same thing. Moving up hard from its lows. Got down as low as, um, looks like about 1750. And uh, now it's up to right around 24. Huge move there. Uh, oil has, uh, wow, oil took a big hit today. Now, I think there are two reasons why oil is coming down. One is that apparently demand is falling, and that's evident when you start looking at the EIA petroleum status report showing uh, lower demand. And also because the federal government has been tapping the strategic reserve and uh, pumping a lot of ba barrels of oil that are meant for emergency use. I guess this is what they consider emergency use. It's really a political emergency. Pumping oil into the economy uh, and thereby creating uh, greater supply and then bringing price down. And they've pumped a lot. I think um, we're down something like 40% in the strategic reserve, which is really there when we have a really a real pressing need, like a war or a natural disaster. Uh, but they've been using that mostly to try to stem inflation. And 
it's done that job fairly well. It, it, it at least some might argue that it, that it stopped the rise in inflation because a big part of inflation is the cost of energy. Uh, but uh, now I think you look at today's move, this, this move down this big bar here, and I think that's showing something a little bit different, especially with those that ISM manufacturing number contraction, showing that uh, we're not really using energy all that much. Uh, some might argue that uh, this is also the, um, the transition from ICE to EV vehicles, or ICE being internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. But that's, that's such a minor thing here, so that's, that's not really what's going on here. Um, we're still totally um, dependent upon our energy from carbon fuels. So that's, that's, uh, that's one thing that's in our favor, I think, from a, an inflation point of view. How's Bitcoin doing? Uh, Bitcoin's still holding its own. It's been going sideways for the longest time. I don't know how much longer that's going to hold out with all the scandals going on and uh, SBF and whether or not he's going to bring the whole cartel down. <laughs> uh, let's see, the dollar. Let's see, this is a five-minute chart. Let's look at a, a wider view. So the dollar uh, has been on a tear lately, but now, look at it, it's coming down, but that you never know that looking at the market. Because typically when the dollar comes down, the market is ripping higher. And that's just hasn't been the case. We've been going sideways for the past, past month, at least. And uh, that's evident when we go here, you can see that. Let's see, let's look at the SPX. No, let's look at, let's see, I've got it somewhere here. Let's look at the daily view. So when you look at the daily view here, you can see this little cluster here. That's the market going sideways since um, the 15th of December. And here we are the first week of uh, January. So the market is setting up in this kind of range here. So the big question is, when is it going to break out of that range? And is it going to go up or down? Now that's, according to the dollar, I mean, that doesn't show, the dollar doesn't show this. We were in another range here, which looked like more of a, a mega megaphone pattern, kind of look like this. All right, so we had a little megaphone pattern going on here, and then the dollar has, uh, I'm sorry, the market has broken down from that. All right? And then came down into this consolidating area. So that that's a little bit of a disconnect with uh, the dollar, All right? That's really, usually when you see the dollar drop like this, you see the market going straight up, but that has not been the case. So the market's going down, the dollar is going down, gold is going up. Gold is going up. <laughs> What's all that about? And uh, bonds, man, bonds have gotten hit big time. It looks like Tesla's stock price. Let's see, what else do we have here? That's about everything. Let's see, we have Tesla, of course. Tesla took a huge hit yesterday. Look at look at that. And uh, if we look at the daily chart of Tesla, man. Now what I'm showing here is apparently a um, a divergence, and um, we can see that. How can we see that? Let's look at the. Uh, linear regression and so we can see here this is the linear regression slope and if we 
where to draw these two. You can see here, here we have um, a higher low and on the slope and a lower low on the on the price. And so that typically indicates a, um, a positive divergence. And so what I would expect from there is some kind of move up by Tesla. And that would be kind of interesting to see where it goes. Where, where could it go? Um, where were the pandemic lows? Oh, they're way back here. So, oh, I don't know. Maybe we could uh, retrace up to here. About 179, that's quite a, that would be quite a retracement. But uh, with that kind of divergence, I think that we might see that. We might see a, this, this just doesn't make any sense on Tesla's part. Although some might argue that this is a mammoth head and shoulders and it had to go down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see um, probably a um, a rally by Tesla, maybe to come up to this volume node here, and then find some uh, some I guess relative comfort or value for a while until it builds a builds a base and then potentially goes higher. Once that fundamental story starts really ringing true. All right. Man, uh, done 40 minutes of this, and I have not yet got to the, the course. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We, the course is going to come. Whether let's, uh, let's take a little break and, um, and then go to the course. So, hold on. I'm going to play some music. Do 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 Right, so this is the um, continuing on with the introduction to the zero dash DTE trading course, and this is all about how we actually conduct business here at zero dash DTE and what our strategy is really based on, and that is asymmetric risk to reward. And what is it, and why is that so darn important? And uh, I think the next slide is actually a, a non-slide because it may not... Let's see, does it have any content? Ah! Yes, asymmetric strategies rule. So what we're saying here is that our strategies are really predicated on a, um, an exaggerated risk-to-reward scenario. So we take uh, a, um, a page out of the book of asymmetry from Nassim Taleb in his book, 
the skin in the game, asymmetry in, every, in everyday life, and anti-fragile, and particularly the black swan theory. And if you know who Nassim Taleb is, then you know that he made what he calls FU money by starting up a, a, um, a fund that is based on asymmetric principles. And that's really kind of like the black swan fund. Not really, but uh, looking for these events that are uh, relatively low probability of happening. And, and so the bet that you make is very, very tiny. But if it does happen, then the return on that bet is going to be huge. Now, another good example of that is that movie, The Big Short. If you remember those two guys that were in their garage that started a hedge fund and they started it with like $140,000 and what they would bet on are these undervalued companies that and they would buy leaps so they would spend small money and if they if they lost hey no big deal it was just a short change but if they won they they made huge amounts of money and they took that small $140,000 stake and turned it into 30 million and then of course they made another asymmetric bet when Brad Pitt came down there and helped them not Brad Pitt but the actor Brad Pitt playing you know, uh, you know, a, a legendary trader, help them get onto the big boys fl uh, trading floor and take advantage of the um, the mortgage crisis and made another asymmetric bet and made more money. So that's another example of asymmetry. But if you were to look at um, just about anybody that's successful in life, people who are successful, uh, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, people in real estate, uh, any kind of artist that uh, puts the, their effort into a particular craft and uh, it doesn't actually cost them a lot of money to make these bets, but if they can put it out there and it and it um, and it gets received well, they can make huge amounts of money. So they are also conducting a type of asymm asymmetric strategy. Um, venture capitalists, particularly, you know, uh, venture capitalists will bet on. 25, 50 different companies and put and invest small amounts in each one. And most of them may not do anything. A very small portion of them will grow up into something okay and pay for all of their expenses. And if they're lucky, they'll have invested in the next Microsoft or Apple. And that will make everything. Again, an asymmetric bet. Real estate, people that are in real estate, they're the ultimate in asymmetry. They don't even use their own money. They use other people's money to compound their investment. So in a way, that's exactly what we're doing here, uh, albeit in a smaller scale and on a daily basis because we are day traders, where we take asymmetric bets, small risk for potentially large reward, typically one to nine, one part risk to nine parts potential reward. And so that means that we could put on a um, a hundred dollar bet and potentially return 900 percent back from that bet now we don't always do that uh, but there is certainly room to in a, a a wide spectrum of types of returns that you could could get between there uh, getting that pinnacle bet happens less often however that still um, leaves us with a very enviable position that our risk is always very small. And because of that, our drawdowns are very small and our equity curves are very are deplete of any kind of real heavy volatility. And so that affords us a, a great deal of comfort. We don't suffer from the anxiety that most traders do with high probability trades where they're putting up $1,000 to try to make $25. And that's the typical scenario for most zero DTE traders, particularly those that are trading iron condors or verticals. They're putting up a lot of money to make a little bit of money. And some people characterize that as like trying to pick up nickels in front of a steamroller. And the problem with that is that, yes, they can put on a very high probability strategy and make that tiny little profit. But over time, there's going to come that time where they're going to hit their risk and it's going to wipe out a good portion of that profit. And in between those times, they're often in the red and filled with anxiety and panic of potentially hitting that max loss, even though they do have a very high degree of probability of making that trade. Uh, they, they still 
are fearful of that loss. So if they get down to a certain level, they'll actually stop out, uh, thereby taking their high probability trade and turning it into something much lower probability. So we avoid all that by, by doing these asymmetric trades. And our primary trade or strategy of choice is the out-of-the-money butterfly. All right. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about win, win rate versus return. Uh, and I, I think that it, that's exactly what I just mentioned, that it's not win rate that gets you across the finish line. Win rate uh, is only part of the picture. Because if you, you could have a, a wonderful win rate. However, if your losers are much bigger than your winners, then you could be a 99% win rate and still be a loser. And that's, that's, that's real life. In our strategy, or at least this one here, it's relatively low win rate. It can be anywhere from 50 to 75%, but the returns are huge. Our returns are generally two to three times uh, our losses, which is quite different from the high probability strategies where their returns are about, on average, I would say, one-tenth the size of their losses. So their wins are only w one and their losses are 10. So they have to win a whole lot of trades in order to avoid that one big lo loser. So we avoid that completely through asymmetric strategies. So what is a long butterfly? So the def definition that is well known of what a long butterfly is, that it's, um, it's an option strategy, first of all. It has uh, equal width bull and bear spreads. Now, this is a particular type of long butterfly that we call a symmetrical butterfly, where both it's made up of two spreads, a bull spread and a, and a bear spread, and they both have exactly the same width. And they share a short strike. So when you put the risk graph together, it kind of looks like a, um, uh, like a pyramid. With, with feet. Some people say it looks like the, the bottom part of a butterfly. Now, the strategy itself for most, most uh, my life in, in trading, uh, people have traded it as a market neutral strategy. However, it is way more effective as a directional strategy. As a market neutral strategy, in the same way that the um, iron condor is a market neutral strategy, you simply the, the risk to reward just isn't there. And it's, um, although the amount of uh, premium collection that you can get from it, that's another feature of the butterfly, can be quite, um, quite explosive. However, because you have such a, uh, a narrow base from which to work with, just the way that butterfly is constructed in, in uh, that larger risk, making it a market neutral strategy is probably, well, I, it is definitely not the best way to go. So we turn it into a directional strategy. Uh, it has fixed risk and capped profit. And it can either be four calls or four puts with three strikes with the same expiration date. So a long butterfly can be either all calls or all puts. Now it's possible to also have another type of butterfly called the iron butterfly which is more like an iron condor, but essentially it is an iron condor where you share the short strikes. And there you have a short call spread, which would be bearish, and a short put spread, which would be bullish. And then when they share their short strikes, they create something that looks just like a long butterfly. In fact, a, an iron butterfly with the same strikes is exactly the same as a, call butterf a long call butterfly or a long put butterfly with the same strikes. It will act the same, it has the same risk, the same reward, everything about it is exactly the same other than the way it's constructed. All right. So this is showing um, how these butterflies would come together. So here you have a, uh, a long call vertical on the left And then a short call vertical. This would be a, a, a long call butterfly. So combined, uh, it's long because it produces a debit, not a credit. So when you put 
it together, they share the short strike. See right here, you see 4,500 and 4,500. This is just showing it apart. So when it comes together, it looks like that triangle that we're all used to seeing. So when you put it together, it looks something like this. And um, if you're at the money, that risk, here I'm showing a one to five risk to reward, which is um, not typical. That's th That would be extremely good. This is probably in a, a, a very high volatility environment um, taken very early in the in the uh, strategy's life cycle that you could get a one to five on a zero DTE day trying to get something at the money like this a one to five risk to reward would be virtually impossible it would be more closer to one to one maybe one to two uh, this particular fly is five wide so if you were to think you know, what is the, how do you calculate the max profit? The max profit is the width, 5, and because it's an option, you multiply that by 100, so that's 500 minus the debit. In this particular case, the debit is 100, so that would be 500 minus 100, so the max reward is 400, and you can see that over here. So that's how you figure out the, um, the max profit. That's the width minus the debit. So here's a variation of the butterfly. This is where you don't have symmetrical wings. These are this, these would be asymmetric wings, and a lot of people won't wonder, well, why don't you do these, Ernie? And as a directional strategy, you have hardly any risk over here, increases your risk to reward, and all the risk is put further out. The problem is that we could potentially go out here and experience that risk. So we would prefer not to do that. This also creates a, a different type of profit curve in between here that acts in a way that is not uh, conducive to day trading. It's, um, it's The profit curve is falling away from us, so it doesn't give us a, a strong edge, unlike the symmetrical fly. And then finally, this is the difference between creating a neutral strategy like on the left you can see the risk is um, sometimes and usually bigger than the reward when you put the money when you put the butterfly at the money so market price equals the short strikes right so that's not we don't like that what we like is to push it out so this would the market price or the current price and then we push the fly out of the money and what this does is it changes the whole risk to reward equation. So our risk is very small compared to the reward, which is very big. So that's how we start off. So here's some basic rules for entering the butterfly. Man, we're almost at the market close. I haven't even looked at it. And th this is just the entry rules. And on the next installment or the next module will go over uh, more detail about how you manage the butterfly but very simple buy a 15 to 30 wide long fly soon after the market opens this is what we do select a directional bias um, and some like to use the 50-day ema um, so in other words if it's below the 50-day ema go bearish if it's above go bullish uh, bearish you buy a long put fly bullish you buy a long call fly although Realistically, it doesn't make a difference one way or the other. You could use all put flies or all call, call flies, but by convention, we use put flies for bearish ones and call flies for bullish ones. They would equal, they would be the exact same strategy. Just that uh, sometimes you might have, because it would be so far out of the money, trying to do a call fly in a bearish situation, the liquidity might not be there. But with the SPX, that's not an issue. Anyways, we just do it by convention. Put fly for... Um, bearish and call fly for bullish. We buy out of the money with a one to nine risk to reward. That's the key. A one to nine risk to reward. So essentially what we're saying is that we make the debit one tenth the width and that will give us that one to nine. And that's what I'm showing with this formula, how you first uh, figure out the max profit and then divide that max profit by the debit, which is our risk. And that gives you the risk to reward. So uh, an example of that, of say a 20 wide, that would be $2,000 potential profit. 
and let's say that its debit was $200. So $2,000 minus $200 is $1,800, right? And so $1,800 would be the max profit of that fly, a 20 wide with a $200 debit. And then you divide the debit into that price, that max profit, and you get the risk to reward. In that case, it would be nine. So, so shorthand, basically, we say that just make the, to get a, a risk to reward of nine, that's the key, is to um, just put the fly on in such a way that the debit is one-tenth of the width. All right. So... Uh, these are some flies that we've put on recently, different sizes, a 15 wide, a 20 wide, and uh, a 30 wide. Uh, all of these were, were um, winning trades, by the way, recently. All right. Um, that's it for that module. Let's, um, let's go back to the big head. There we are. And uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, another installment of the... Zero dash, zero dash DTE out of the money butterfly course. And we'll, um, in future modules, we'll talk about the strategy uh, and, uh, and other things that will be very impactful in terms of how you conduct yourself as a trader, how you analyze your trades, etc. So it's going to be a good course. All right, uh, let's do that roll call now. We're almost at the end. Man, we only, let's see, where's the market? Let's see, where, where is the market? Oh, look, we're making a, a comeback here. See, it's moving up. And Tesla moved up today too. Let's see, let's look at Tesla. Uh, Tesla ended on a high note, that's good. Excellent. All right, let's do our roll call. Uh, first, we have uh, JMO Jones. How you doing, JMO? I'm sorry I get so late into the roll call. From now on, I'll do the roll call uh, at the intermission between the two segments. And uh, he was kind enough to tell me that my song in the beginning needed to be longer. <laughs> we'll fix that. And uh, Brent is here. How you doing, Brent? And Rob Fresno. Uh, Jay Hen is here. Thank you very much for showing up. And is with his double barrel. Hello. Uh, one, two, three. Happy Street. I'm not saying hi. I'm describing the market today, but also. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. David Stewart. Hey, Ernie. Hope you're doing well. I learned what I needed with the service last year and really appreciate all the help. Still love the videos. Thank you very much, David. And let's see, we have uh, Diesel Viper. That's a great name. Started the new year off right. Got me 75% on my butterfly today. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We like that. And um, Charles Olinger, how you doing? Is that a custom squeeze indicator in the lower chart? Um, it is one of the indicators that you can find inside TradingView, and uh, it, it's, um, it is a squeeze indicator, but I'm more interested in the linear regression portion of it, the oscillator, to see the, to see the um, uh, divergence. Uh, linear regression with price provides the, uh, a superior divergence indicator. And uh, Profits Reaper, how you doing? First time here live. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, Max, you're not late. I'm late in saying hello, but thank you very much for showing up. And um, Jimmy Frank, how you doing? Thank you very much for showing up. Okay. It says, double win today, Ernie. Thank you. My bear butterfly closed for 250%, and then my late day bull hedge closed for in the money for 80%. All right. <laughs> All right. We love it when, when our members make money. All right. Uh, so that's it. That's it for today. 
I have to uh, close up shop now. The wife is going to be down here in a few seconds. The dog is going to, one of the dogs is going to come down and say, hey, take me for a walk. And so that's where I'm off to now. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, hopefully, you, hopefully you like this show. Give it a thumbs up and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Peace. Peace to you all. Take care. And now for the exit music. Gotta knock his block off once a day. That's Bitcoin Bob. Peace.